Hello and welcome to the very first edition of Let's Talk Human Rights, the new video and podcast series by the Maastricht Centre for Human Rights. In this series, we will be speaking to a number of different human rights experts about their research, their area of expertise and their experience as human rights researchers. We have a particular focus on early career researchers, so those who are only just starting out on their career in human rights research. My name is Sally Thin, I am a PhD candidate in international law and I will be your host for today. Here with me are the lovely Sarah Gibbon and Stephen van der Putt. Uh, would you like to introduce yourselves, Sarah? Sure, so um, I'm Sarah, I am a PhD candidate here at Maastricht University. I am in my final year of my PhD now, so I've been here for, for four years. Uh, my research focuses on uh, the responsibility and capacity of what I call uh, effective non-state territorial entities. I'm sure we'll get into exactly what an effective non-state territorial <laughs> entity is in more detail later on. Uh, Stephen? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Stephen. Uh, I'm uh, also a PhD candidate here at uh, Maastricht University. I'm an external PhD candidate, so I'm combining my research here with my uh, function at the Netherlands Defence Academy. And my research looks at accountability and reparations for human rights violations during UN peace operations. Thanks. Now, doing a PhD myself, I know how frustrating it is when somebody asks you to summarize what it is that you do um, for your research. But if you could, could you please give a brief overview in a few sentences of what your research is? Uh, Sarah, if you'd like to start again. Oh, I, was hoping, I was hoping Stephen would have a chance. <laughs> Um, so effectively what my research is all about is that what I would say entities that look and feel like states um, but aren't states as we understand that term in international law and understanding how the international legal framework treats them, um, what capacity we allocate them and how we assign them responsibility if we assign them responsibility in international law. And are you looking at any particular examples? Yes, so I have four uh, particular examples that I look at. Um, I look at ISIS in the Middle East, in particular in Syria, uh, Taiwan, Crimea and Somaliland. So quite a geographically diverse uh, set of examples. Quite a mix. Um, and Stephen? Yeah, um, well, I look mainly at what happens whenever um, human rights violations are committed during UN peace operations and then mainly if individuals would have a claim against the organization and if they would how that claim would need to be redressed so um, yeah the very emphasis yeah, the main emphasis of my research would be on the part of what happens after the violation takes place so what would an organization um, yeah what excuse what would um, what claim would an individual have against the organization and be able to c claim compensation or redress for the violation that was committed against them? So I think two really interesting topics, but also what I think is also very interesting is the overlap between both of your research topics. Um, before we get into that, I just wanted to ask you quickly about how you got into human rights research. So what was it that made you interested in, in research and human rights, but also particularly in your topic? So how did you end up doing what you're doing just now? Um, Stephen, would you like to start yeah. to switch oh, up to the order? switch it up a bit. <laughs> yeah, now, um, well, originally I studied uh, philosophy, politics and economics, which was quite a broad degree. But what really interested me there was like kind of the more applied ethics. And uh, within international law, that led me to kind of drift towards human rights, as I saw it as like, well, ideally at the time being idealistic and just having graduated from university as like uh, mm -hmm. affirmation of human dignity and sort of applied ethics within the world. And that really piqued my interest um, with that. And then like um, that led me to apply to do a master's in human rights law in uh, Belfast. And um, yeah, well, Belfast has quite a unique uh, history with human rights as well, um, especially during what took place there during the Troubles. And that actually led me more to also become interested in um, human rights during uh, conflicts, especially um, in situations of co armed conflict or, well, below the threshold of armed conflict, but still um, a lot very violent situations. Uh, and that's, yeah, eventually also led to my uh, master uh, dissertation, which focused on the Sobrenica cases, which were very topical at the time. Sarah? 
Uh, well, I, uh, I'm from South Africa and uh, we obviously have a very dark and dirty history when it comes to human rights with, uh, uh, with apartheid. And uh, in my final year of high school, we had to do a history project on, on something and I chose to do uh, the role of music in ending apartheid. Um, and in researching this and kind of getting to know a little bit more about uh, the sort of daily lives of people living under the apartheid regime, I became very interested in, in human rights and the, the idealist, the young idealist, I was like, wow. I think we're all still idealists. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it changes, does it? <laughs> I thought, wow, oh, you know what, I know, I finally know what I'm going to do. I'm going to change the world. Um, had no idea what I was going to do in terms of like how that was going to happen. But I figured, you know what, human rights law sounds like a good place to start. Went off to university to study law, knew nothing about law, what it entailed. But luckily for me, it worked out rather well. Um, and when I was finishing my undergrad, I focused my research uh, on uh, torture uh, as a counter-terrorism technique. Um, and I then went into practice for a while. Uh, I also did my master's uh, overseas and studied international law and international human rights, uh, where I focused a little bit more on the international criminal law aspects of it. Um, I then uh, went back to practice uh, in South Africa again. Um, in, my, in my practice, rather than academic research, I've had the privilege of working for the Constitutional Court of South Africa, we did a lot of uh, casework there uh, on Bill of Rights litigation, which was absolutely fantastic and gave, us, gave me a very practical insight into human rights and, and how that looks on the ground for implementation um, in litigation. But research has kind of always drawn my interest and mm -hmm. I kept coming back to this idea of there are, there are issues that I want to look into, there are questions I want to ask and that practice was not allowing me to do that. So uh, when it came to the PhD, I, I knew I needed to come back and do the PhD at some point. And uh, I, I then chose to focus on the non-state uh, entities. Um, my research is perhaps a little more general than, than your research, Stephen, but it's, it, sits at a, it sits at a level that asks um, about this re responsibility and capacity issue because it's it's something that affects the implementation of human rights. Mm -hmm. um, if we've got these geopolitical realities of these non-state entities um, that are very, very real in the lives of people every day, we have to know how to deal with them, how to, um, how to enforce human rights, implement human rights, and ensure that they're protected. Um, so that's why I went for a more general approach, but something that still allows me to impact uh, human rights, which is very close to my heart. Let me ask you there, because I think um, both of you in different ways are focusing here on, on non-state actors. Um, and I think maybe some people who are listening or watching from home today uh, won't necessarily know why that makes these questions much more difficult. Um, so in brief, a non-state actor is exactly what it sounds like. So an actor in international law that is not a state. So that can cover everything from individuals to international organizations like the UN um, to entities like you were talking about. Um, could you uh, maybe explain why, when an actor isn't a state, that makes it particularly difficult to talk about human rights responsibility or human rights accountability in international law? Uh, Sarah. Sure, so uh, as you mentioned, I mean, the the primary actors in international law are states. Um, another big one is international organizations, as, as you focus on. Um, but ultimately, all responsibility in international law uh, is they try to track it through states somehow. Um, we work with customary international law principles of state responsibility, um, and there are all sorts of rules for assigning responsibility, we call it attribution, determining who's responsible for uh, conduct and how we hold them responsible for that conduct. And if it's only states that are ever held responsible, but we have a large number of non-state actors in the international system or in the world, we have a huge gap where, where human rights is not, it may not be effectively protected. It, it, they're not always the, 
the people who are violating um, mm-hmm. the human rights. In fact, sometimes they are doing a better job of protecting human rights than the states themselves. But there is a gap in, in human rights there mm-hmm. when you have a massive actor that's not actually dealt with in the attribution framework. Yeah. So essentially, we uh, in international law, we focus uh, a lot, perhaps you might say too much, on what states do and don't do, and sometimes within that uh, perspective, non-state actors can slip through the net. Um, when we're talking about responsibility and accountability for um, for human rights, especially by non-state actors, what are the different steps that you that we need to kind of get through or that we need to establish, Stephen? Yeah, well, um, I think one of the first challenges would be establishing that a non-state actor has an actual obligation. So there are a couple of of sources of obligations within international law. They could be treaty based, which are kind of agreements conducted between states. But you also have customary law, law, international law. And you can now see that um, a lot of people have started to argue that certain human rights now form part of customary international law. And that is argued by basis of state practice, so what states actually do, and what uh, legal scholars call opinio juris, or the yeah, conviction that what they do is also the result of a legal obligation. So that would be kind of the first step, because without that you can't really discuss um, a violation then um, if that if you have established that there is an actual obligation then the second step would be what Sarah already mentioned would be to attribute that to the party in question so um, there are some certain rules um, within international law that deal with the attribution um, what you can see is that they're quite well developed uh, mm. when it comes to states but that it's a lot more difficult to argue effectively when you're dealing with non-state actors and you see that both on the cases of international organizations where there's a lot more discussion about who's responsible either uh, the state uh, that's a member of the international organization or the international organization itself and yeah i don't really even want to get into the hornet's (laughs) nest that sarah's dealing with when we're talking about attribution um if you've established those two then you can kind of speak about a wrongful act which in general international law terms would lead also to an obligation to compensate or provide redress for that act there are, however, some exceptions to that rule, um, which uh, yeah, are summed up with the all, oil, all old lawyer saying of it depends. Um, but uh, some uh, entities within international law have far reaching immunities. And I think my research, uh, well, a big part of that is dealing with the immunity of the UN, because if you see now, uh, for example, uh, in both uh, the Srebrenica cases, uh, there was a big case in Haiti which dealt with cholera, which was uh, allegedly spread by uh, Nepali peacekeepers that the UN sent there. But in all those cases, the courts pretty much say, well, the UN is immune, so you can't mm-hmm. bring your case here, which kind of leaves the victim without an avenue or a forum where they can bring their case to. Um, Lastly, which is also a bit more of a contentious uh, issue as well, is that you would have to argue, if you're talking about individuals, that the individual would have a claim. Within international law, what you see is that uh, states are the primary actor, but that's occasionally also the case when it comes to redress, which would mean that the state would have to argue on behalf of its citizens to claim that a violation has taken place instead of that citizens can do so directly against the entity that has offended their rights. So those are kind of, I would say, the four major steps you would have to establish um, for talking about accountability and redress for human rights violations. Mm -hmm. So let's take it back to the first one then for, um, I think there's there's a lot in there to unpick and I hope we'll have time to go through at least most of it today. Um, But for the the actual obligations, so the the obligations that um, we're talking about, whether or not non-state actors have violated these human rights obligations, what kinds of um, obligations and what kinds of violations are you both talking about in your research? I know, Sarah, yours is quite general, quite like abstract level, um, but you're looking in particular at uh, peacekeeping operations. So what kinds yeah. of, um, I suppose, f- uh, what kinds of conduct uh, are you talking about within peacekeeping operations and what human rights do you think are being violated there or have been violated? Um, may well, have been violated. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, what, what you have is you have um, some uh, very big incidents. Um, like there was, um, it was the Somali affair where uh, Canadian peacekeepers were accused of torture within uh, S- Somalia. 
Um, and that was, uh, yeah, that led to major cases. But then, for example, because those were criminal cases within Canada, it kind of left the victims without an opportunity to present a claim or to gain any form of redress because Canada wouldn't allow a litigation guardian. So they, and they weren't able to prosecute within Canada themselves. Um, so I would say um, torture would be a main one. Um, you also see that in some cases uh, it has been argued that sexual uh, abuse can amount to torture. So that would be a broader category within there. Um, and lastly, I think a lot of it is also focusing on the right to life. Um, what you see is that uh, within international law, there's two frameworks which kind of deal with the use of deadly force. Uh, you have international humanitarian law, but international humanitarian law generally only applies within armed conflict. Um, and what you see with peace operations is that they operate in a lot of areas where they do use deadly force or there is still violence, but they fall below the threshold of an armed conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, in those cases, um, the use of deadly force could amount to a violation of the right to, to life within human rights law. So I would say those are the two main ones I'm currently looking at. Mm -hmm. as, as violations by the UN itself. Yeah, yeah. 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 And do you look at particular human rights there, or are you looking more generally at um, at the capacity to respect human rights? I'm looking more generally, although there are um, examples that come up in sort of each uh, territorial study, um, and that, that can differ from, from place to place. In mm. one of my territories is Somaliland, Somalia, so there are uh, some rights that you've perhaps seen in your research that come up. Um, for example, ISIS in the Middle East, there's some, there's some, of course, some human rights issues there. Mm -hmm. um, although I think it's a little bit more general in the sense, for example, of looking at things like the right to citizenship or nationality um, and statelessness. That's something that comes up in, in my research, mm -hmm. um, because if you've got um, residents of these territories where they've got a completely different legal system to the, let's say, recognized state for lack of a better term although i don't like that term but recognized state uh would would their citizenship their nationality be recognized by other states mm -hmm. um are they stateless are they not stateless these are the kinds of questions that do come up in my research could you give a, an example of so one of the places where there's um, perhaps a, a recognized state and then an unrecognized territorial entity um in my studies mm -hmm. yeah so um <laughs> so I think uh, China and Taiwan are a very uh, good example, <laughs> quite a topical example at the moment. Um, so I work with the four different entities for me represent a spectrum of these uh, non-state entities. I don't work with, with international organizations like you do. I've excluded those from, from my research um, from something that looks the least like a state to something that looks the most like a state. But Taiwan and China are a very good example because... Taiwan has its own constitution, its own courts, it, its own military. It looks and feels very much like um, a state like the Netherlands, where we sit here today, for example. Um, but it is legally part of China. Um, and uh, there are repercussions for, um, for states that would say they recognize Taiwan as an independent uh, state from China. Uh, and interestingly, there are some relations developing there, for example, between Somaliland and Taiwan. There has recently been some exchange of, um, of I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say diplomats because they're calling it unofficial. It's not official recognition, but they have set up offices um, in Taiwan and in Somaliland um, that looks a little bit like uh, diplomats. So there are these sorts of things happening um, on the side, but technically Taiwan would be considered an unrecognized uh, state of, within the recognized state of China. Mm. Good example. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, for, so we've talked a little bit then about the, the obligation side, and then I think, um, if I remember correctly, the next step that you said was attribution. Mm. Um, and I know that both of you deal with attribution as quite a big part of your research in different ways. Um, perhaps for those at home that um, haven't studied international law before. Um, essentially, we need to talk about attribution because in international law, often the actors that we're talking about aren't real in the sense that they aren't an individual. So you can't say um, that that 
Germany has done something. It is uh, perhaps Germany's foreign minister mm. um, or, or president or somebody in the German armed forces. So when individuals um, carry out conduct, we need to have rules to say who that conduct um, is attributed to. So who in law um, has, has done that conduct, so to speak. And we have rules for doing that with states, so for attributing conduct to states. Um, but then, as I understand, at least from your research, the, the rules for attributing conduct to non-states are slightly more complex. Could you perhaps go into a bit more detail as to how you deal with attribution in your work? Sure. Stephen? Um, yeah, well, um, the issue you have with the UN is that there's technically the possibility of attributing it to two actors. Um, because the UN doesn't have its own military forces, as soon as they conduct the peace operations, they borrow uh, military personnel from member states and they actually execute the peace operation. And what you then get is quite often a debate if, uh, if a violation takes place, if that can be attributed to A, the state, or B, the international organization. Um, and I think a good example of where you've seen that is what I already briefly men mentioned in the introduction is the Srebrenica case. Uh, the courts there went into a quite a detailed examination if uh, the Dutch state would be responsible or if the UN would be responsible. Um, what the court said there is that in general it doesn't see any um, reason to not believe that double attribution is a possibility. Um, so it's not, excuse me, it's not a possibility. Um, so it didn't really exclude that as an option. But it said that, for example, uh, usually it would be the case that whenever uh, peace operations are conducted, uh, military personnel then acts as an agent of the organization and that the organization was responsible. But in the specific case of the uh, Srebrenica cases, that because the Dutch uh, government was so involved with the redeployment of the forces, that it said that the Dutch state in this specific case was also responsible for the fall of Srebrenica. Mm -hmm. So then, um, then I, I suppose there are two questions there. There's the, the question of um, whether the, the breach itself, so the, the act of violating the human rights, is attributable to, to potentially two different actors. Um, but then I suppose, for me anyway, the question also arises, so who is actually responsible for... for um, respecting and fulfilling human rights within a particular territory. Is that something that you deal with, Sarah? It is and it isn't. Um, so my research is, has focused on this, on this notion of, of attribution more generally and understanding mm -hmm. the, the flaws in it. Um, it's a little less developed, the framework, uh, in relation to my entities. Um, and what we found or what, what I found is that uh, it always comes back to states. They always try to, um, when I say they, states, um, courts, they always try to bring it back to states, whether that be through uh, non-state actors acting on behalf of the state or them being effectively controlled by the state. This is a, a term that has come up through the jurisprudence. Um, so at the end of the day, they always wanted to be a state and I think when we talk about human rights, there is uh, a little bit more room for the understanding that non-state actors may have some human rights obligations, and there are arguments that are made that they may have um, a human rights responsibilities. Um, but I think that primarily uh, the main argument is still that it's that states have some kind of obligation to ensure that non-state actors are protecting human rights. Um, my, my research is then trying to, to shift that discourse a little bit and say that we, we can focus a little bit more on non-state actors as non-state actors um, and work more with them as a very real player in the system. Um, do you find that that's the same for you? That it's, if you, if you think, I know you work mostly with organizations, but yeah. Would you would you say that you agree that it's still state based? Um, I think that's also just uh, I think that's the same within my research, but I think that's also just a result of necessity, as mm -hmm. in because the UN's immunity is so kind of well established, 
uh, people start looking for alternative ways to still get a mm. form of redress. Mm. And I think that has influenced why people have started to uh, try to hold states accountable instead of the international organization. Mm. I don't think that's per legally correct per se, but I think that is currently kind of the path of yeah. least resistance. I think when you have a system that is entirely built around states, then it becomes the easiest way to, mm. to do that, doesn't it? So We are coming to the end of our time, um, but what I would like to have from you each in a couple of sentences, if you can, why do you think your research matters? So why do you think your research is relevant in the real world? Because often as researchers, as academics, we get that criticism that, you know, you kind of live in an ivory tower, you mm. don't... Um, aren't so connected to the real world. So in a couple of sentences, why do you think your research matters for the real world? Sarah. Um, so like I mentioned, it's, it seems quite general and theoretical, but at the end of the day, it, it is very relevant in the lives of people who live in non-state um, territorial entities because it affects questions like marriage, divorce, adoption, nationality, will these kinds of acts be recognized um, in other states um, and particularly for example with the movement of people around the planet at the moment um, both refugee and non-refugee these issues become uh, very real um, so i think that 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 is the the shortest version i can give you <laughs> of the relevance <laughs> Stephen? yeah well i think um if the un takes its role seriously as an organization built upon human rights it should also in a way offer redress and compensation for human rights violations that are committed on its watch i think that's both like an operational incentive we live in a world that's emphasizing accountability a lot more especially within international law you have the icc and a lot of that institutions like that pop up that uh, the hybrid tribunals that deal with violations and say that impunity is no longer acceptable um, and then on the other hand i also think that it's uh, just also to offer some redress for the victims there um, at the moment there is there is just a massive accountability gap and i think that's still something that needs to be addressed at the moment well two very interesting research projects i'm looking forward to reading them when they're finished now i have one last quick question for you to be as serious or as silly as you would like if you could add one new human right to human rights law, what would it be, Sarah? It would be the right to free access to menstrual products to people who menstruate. Stephen? Uh, I think there might be a discussion had with technical developments at the moment about a right to a basic income. Yes. Two very interesting, very interesting new human rights for the human rights lexicon. I think also both probably very beneficial to human rights law to, to have those conversations. Um, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, thank you very much to everyone at home who uh, listened or watched this. Um, if people want to find out more about your research, how can they find you, Stephen? I am on Twitter, not very active yet, but um, it is developing. <laughs> uh, I am not on Twitter. <laughs> But uh, people are welcome to check out my university webpage and contact me directly through the details there um, or my LinkedIn profile. Thank you. So once again, that's Stephen von der Put, Sarah McGibbon. Thank you very much. Um, you can, of course, always find out more about the researchers at the Maastricht Centre for Human Rights at Maastricht University, um, uh, forward slash MCFHR. That's Maastricht University .nl. Um, forward slash MCFHR or on Twitter at MC underscore human rights. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, viewers and listeners. And we hope to see you back here again next time. <laughs>